Thank you very much, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Davenport. I'm at SunTrust. Uh, I'm a CFA. Uh, with me today is Carol Cox. Carol is also a CFA at Synovus. And Craig Ruff is also a member of our board at the ASFIP Foundation. And uh, he's at Georgia State. So I guess I'd like to explain to you who we are and what we're trying to do. And then I'd like to talk to you about what we think is important in terms of financial literacy. I think all of you will understand the concepts a lot better than the average person listening to these ideas. And that's why I think this is an opportunity for you to uh, lead and make a difference as you move forward in your careers and in the community. Um, we were founded about a year and a half ago out of the Atlanta Society of Finance and Investment Professionals. We have about 1,500 members with an average experience of about 20 years. So 30,000 years of industry experience. We felt that we wanted to channel that into the community to solve the problems that Georgia has with financial literacy. Georgia as a state has some of the statistics that are not very good in terms of per capita that we lead the country in uh, lottery tickets per, per person. We uh, also are one of the top five in bankruptcies. Um, and we also have an issue with uh, people using payday loans and using 401k loans. The rest of the country averages about 10% and Georgia averages about 15. All of these things are a concern for us in our industry and are concern for our community going forward. And I think it's an opportunity for us to take the knowledge we have and channel it into the community. The CFA designation, for those who don't know, is globally recognized. It requires four years of experience, a three-level exam, but when you achieve it, as we talk about human capital, you have it with you forever. And that achievement will make your career and your, um, your life afterwards, um, I think, uh, greatly improved in terms of financial well-being. The, the program that we have established is, um, has four principles. The four principles are live with less, invest in you, manage risk, and invest for you. The important difference here is it's not the dollars that you have in your bank account or the amount in your brokerage account. It's you as an asset going forward, generating income, and then using that income well to lead to financial well-being that's going to make you financially well off. And understanding that human capital aspect is a key part of what we're doing. Um, we're going to go through the four different parts. Carol's going to cover live with less and invest for you. And then I'm going to come back with manage risk and uh, invest in you. So thanks. OK, thank you, Steve. And thank you for inviting us and letting us spend a little time with you. Um, live with less. This, a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about are, are not real difficult to understand. I think the problem is just taking the time in our lives to really think about things and, and to plan. Um, live with less is probably the most important principle that you can live by and paying yourself first. They should be guiding principles for your life. So what, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to end up? Where do you want to be? I think a lot of us just kind of get it. You go to school, you start interviewing, you, you know, take the job that you get an offer for or whatever. You know, some people are lucky and have different choices. All of us have different career paths. But a lot of times we just end up on that merry-go-round and we aren't really thinking about what did we really, and we look back later and say, what did we really want out of life? And is this the type of life I wanted to lead? And it just in my own example, uh, my husband's from Washington State. I was from Indiana. We started out living in Georgia. And we never really discussed, do we ever want to live near family after we, ha after we have children? Or so? Do we want to live you know, near family? Would that be the type of lifestyle where the cousins know each other and so forth? It just never came up. And we never thought about it. And we're all just, you know, we're busy with our careers and raising children. And then, like I say, you look back later and you say, you know, gee, maybe if we had talked about that and thought about that, our career paths might have been a little different. So whether it's financials or the, the type of life you need to lead, it's really important that you have a, a discussion or at least give these things some thought, and then you can get on the career path. It doesn't mean it won't be adjusted. There will be a lot of adjustments along the way. 
But think about where do you want to be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, and what do you have to give up or do to get there? Is that really what you want? And, and you know, if you decide it is, then you have a better chance of achieving that because you can direct your goals that way. So the, one of the most important things you can do is establish your goals, create a budget, make it doable, assess the effectiveness of what you're doing well or not well, and then readjust. There's no benefit um, to coming up with a budget and defining your goals if you become discouraged and you give up. Um, we're just going to go through a few of these little slides in more detail, uh, the important ones that, you know, define goals and gather data. So spend a little time looking at your income level or what your potential is and, and uh, where your priorities are. You need to define short-term goals and long-term goals. And, and there are some medium-term goals as well in there. So uh, prioritize. Um, there might be trade-offs you have to make. Uh, do you want to uh, have a car, own a car? Do you want to rent a home? Do you want to buy a home? Um, do you want to travel? Is traveling throughout your life important to you? But um, tr try to make sure that you're going to pay yourself first. And no matter what the other goals are that you have, that you put money aside uh, for expenses that um, you may not know are coming. Uh, there's nothing like being hit with you know, having to buy new tires or something and you don't have the money for it. And I understand the statistics are pretty grim about most Americans are not able to come up with uh, even five or six hundred dollars emergency money without borrowing it. And that's really, when you think about it, that's pretty sad. And when you live with that in that kind of, with that in your life, it's extremely stressful. So it causes you to react differently to in lots of ways of your life because you're under that stress and that pressure. And I think if you find that you live with a little less and you, you prioritize your spending, you'll be a lot better off in the long run. And probably one of the most important things on this slide is to take advantage of free money. As soon as you start a job and you can participate in a 401k or a profit sharing plan or a stock purchase plan, particularly where the company contributes a nice portion towards that stock purchase, make sure you put as the maximum or as much money as you can into those types of investments. First off, with the 401ks or IRA, they grow tax-free, and that is so powerful. If you don't have to pay income tax or capital gains tax, that is just really powerful. Um, and use flexible spending accounts. Or there are a lot of health savings accounts today, uh, and you're going to be paying it for your expenses with tax-free dollars. So that's uh, extremely important to take advantage of those plans. Monitor your outcomes and analyze your variances. Now, we all live busy lives, but it's important that you assess, you know, are my goals reasonable periodically? Am I meeting, am I, uh, you know, living within the budget? Uh, what adjustments should I make? Uh, where am I going awry? You know, am I spending too much on entertainment or just frivolous purchases and not even realizing how much that adds up to? Um, so look at every major area of spending, whether it's quarterly or semi-annually, uh, and make adjustments both to your goals and to your budget. So just to kind of recap of live with less, determine what's important and prioritize. Pay yourself first, establish short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals, and try to live off of what you're making and not have extensive use of credit card debts. Um, live on less than you make and save for long-term wealth accumulation. Invest for you. Um, I thought this chart was interesting because it kind of gives you a picture of what, what your goals are, what type of goals you should have. And you may not have every one of these. Some of these might not be important to you, um, but others may be. And you can kind of see how, which type of things should be considered short term and, and what should be considered long term. So remember, um, building wealth takes time. 
but it's amazing how much you can accumulate even with small amounts of money when you don't touch that money you leave it there you let uh, the dividends and interest compound and you use that accumulation of assets to buy more assets the power of compounding and interest earning interest on interest cannot be emphasized enough um, if any of you are familiar with Dave Ramsey or have taken his course, he has an example of the power of compounding where he has two brothers. And one brother at age 19 puts 2000 a year in an investment account, and they're earning, he uses 10%, which may be high today, but and it's probably a, a stock portfolio at 10%. Um, but he puts money, 2000 away until age 26 and never puts any more money in. He ends up at age uh, 65 with over $2 million, $2,288,996. The second um, brother doesn't start saving until age 27. He puts in 2000 until he's age 65. And he, at the end of it, he only has $1,532,166. So the first brother only put in $16,000, but he did it very early in life. So that is just, I think, an, uh, an amazing example of the power of compounding. And if you get started early, make a commitment, put a little bit of money. You're young, so your money should go into the stock market. It can just be in a broad S&P fund or, you know, Russell fund. And, and just leave it alone, make a commitment not to touch that money. And it's amazing how much it can accumulate to. Risk and return. We all know that if you don't take much risk, you're not gonna have much return. In fact, on cash and savings accounts or CDs, you're not earning hardly any money at all. Um, so uh, fix, fixed income or bonds, you're gonna earn three, three or four to percent. Um, and we're more likely in a rising rate environment, you stand, you might lose principal. So you're young, you really don't need fixed income at this point. Property, real estate has always been one of the best long-term investments until 2008, 2009, but over the long-term, there have been a lot of studies that show that most people, one of the biggest factors towards them attaining some wealth uh, over their lifetime has been through property ownership or owning their home, own home. And then, of course, there are stocks. They're the, considered the most risky on the risk return line, but you're going to get the best return uh, over time out of a stock portfolio. Be cognizant of fees. Fees are really important. Um, most managers charge 1% or more to manage money. And again, when you take that 1% out, usually it's paid quarterly, so that's money that's coming out of your account, 1% a year, it's not staying there to compound, that can be quite significant, um, particularly over a 30, 40 year period. So, um, and the other thing is trading. A lot of young people really think they're enamored by trading. Um, a lot of them want, they want to trade as a career. Um, Trading is very difficult. It adds a lot of cost to the portfolio and a lot of turnover. If you trade in a tax-exempt account, at least you're not paying capital gains taxes every time you trade. But um, if it's a, a personal account, that can have a, a, quite an impact on, on you. So it's been shown over time that the, the lowest turnover managers often have the better performance. Um, and, and then, um, again, be aware of capital gains taxes and not taking um, taking long-term gains and not short-term gains. And, and then, of course, the growing of tax-free money is, is quite beneficial. On this next chart, this just gives you an idea of the types of things that you should consider in your 20s, 30s, 40s. And there's no set formula. It can be, it'll be different for, for all of us. Uh, the things that other people may want to accomplish by their 30s or, or their situation, we all earn money at different rates. Uh, some people earn a lot early, more of us later on in life. Um, but these are things that you can think about and kind of plan for. So understand where you are in your life cycle, and since you're all very young, understand how important it is for you to start saving early and to live within your means. On the last page, we have a little summary, just you know, to start early, 
let the miracle of compounding work for you, have a plan, spend a little time thinking about what you want out of life, where you want to be, come up with a budget and, and some goals. And then invest systematically and automatically. It's just like Social Security. They take that 12% out. You don't even know about it. You don't miss it. And hopefully it'll be around by the time you all retire. But at least it's not, it may not be great, but at least it provides a floor so that there will be something there for you. But if you, you want to live better than that, you're going to have to invest for yourself and contribute to your own retirement. And again, doing this early is going to make a significant difference in where you end up down the road. Thank you, Carol. The section I'm going to start with here is invest in you. And I think that this graph kind of captures what I believe is key for all of you. The biggest asset you have is, is right here. It's you. Your potential for income over the next 40 years discounted is created this human capital that is going to be in demand in the market and is going to be compensated and just the act of going to college is the greatest determinant in terms of person, people having financial well-being. It's no accident that the country has 30% college graduates and about 30% of people have some level of savings and some level of uh, financial comfort with their lives. Those statistics are extremely important for people who are in college and, and graduating from college to understand because you have an advantage and an opportunity that I think is important in terms of how we impact the community. Right now as an industry, we are under siege in terms of the media and other people looking at what we do and saying people on Wall Street are greedy, people on Wall Street are not focused, they only care about themselves. And I believe from the CFA experience I've had working in this society for the last 10 years, that's completely not true. There are many people who are concerned and care about what their clients achieve, what society achieves, and that's part of the reason uh, that we're doing this. I think that when I think about this graph in terms of you know, financial assets, you can invest in yourself more at the beginning and potentially end up with you know, a master's degree or other degrees or certifications. Um, but the one thing I find most important is the idea that you have to believe that you've got to take care of yourself. Working yourself 10, 12 hours a day at a job that might not be productive, creating stress in your life, you're not being compensated fully for the full hours that you're working, you know, leads to health, leads to other issues. You've got to ask yourself, you know, is this the right way to invest in myself? Am I living the life that I wanted? And how does that life lead me to where I want to uh, be in terms of my plan? So. I think that this is a great graph because it shows you how your financial assets are going to be small at the beginning. You have debt, you have other reasons why there's not going to be a lot of financial assets, but your human asset is huge. Using that human capital going forward, using it effectively by saving, not, not spending all the, you have and not trading too much. I think that we mentioned trading. I, I think our short-termism as a culture is an issue that we need to think about. When you focus on the long term and you allow yourself to ride out volatility, you know, your performance goes way up. That's true in life and that's true in the market. Um, the next chart looks at the three areas that we focus on investing. Invest in your human capital, invest in your health, and invest in contentment. Um, the best quote I've seen for this is, uh, education is not a bucket to fill, rather it is a fire to keep burning. Your education when you're done is not going to be it. You're going to want to improve your presentation skills. You're going to want to improve um, some of your analytical skills. You're going to pr pursue other professional designations, hopefully the CFA. Um, and then you're going to think about how do you move and make yourself more valuable so that I can then earn more income, find myself in better financial shape, find more contentment, and it leads all back to the same thing which is taking care of yourself and making sure that you put yourself in a position where the market values your skills and you are comfortable with the lifestyle you've established and you're also content with the money that you're making because you're able to create through savings a, a better life. This graph, I think, um, summarizes what we've talked about. 
in terms of college. As you can see, all workers average about $860 a week. All of the areas with a degree are much higher than that number. And all of the numbers on the right in terms of employment, unemployment rate are much lower. So when we talk about unemployment, systematic unemployment in the country, we're really not talking about what's happening with college graduates. So I think that sometimes we look at things and we say, there's a large problem. There's a shortage of talented people, and that shortage is going to grow, not lessen. As we have the baby boomers get out of the workforce, there's going to be more demand for people to accomplish more and be more efficient. So I think that the, the one thing I'd say is your educational attainment is important. Um, and I think that the stability of your earnings is also uh, a great benefit to your uh, achievement of a bachelor's degree. This chart, I think, um, talks about the question about health. We are looking at employers, and employers have said that one thing that they noticed about their employers, that employees that have a problem, is questions about depression and stress. The questions about depression and stress, one of the main factors, money. How do you handle money? So when I think about health care and I think about what's happening with depression and stress in people's lives, an unhealthy lifestyle leads to an increasing cost of about $1,500 per year. If almost 60% of the population doesn't have $1,000 for an emergency, these people can't afford, you can't afford to have that health care drain on your cash flow affecting your income and affecting your well-being. So I think that it's a virtuous circle. As you improve your health, your health care costs go down, your stress goes down. As your stress goes down, your performance at work improves, your attendance improves, and guess what? Your compensation improves. Your compensation improves, and we start the cycle again. So it is all related, and you need to take control of it in order to be successful at it. And, and this is one of those things that there are hard things to do in life. There are partial differential equations. There are bond maturities and modified duration calculations. And then there are easy things like managing your spending and understanding where, how much money you have, how much money you can spend, and breaking it down into needs, wants, and savings. Pay yourself first. Put 20% in savings. 30% in wants and 50% in needs. And your, your health and your well-being will be improved. Um, the recommendation, if, if you follow your doctor, 20 to 30 minutes, three to four days a week will, will reduce stress and improve lasting benefits to your health. The last thing is contentment. Um, this issue sounds a little bit um, soft and fuzzy. And I had questions about whether we should include it. But I think the issue of stress and depression being so large in our society means that we have to look at why people are stressed and depressed. And therefore, when we look at this, we saw contentment after $75,000, it, it really is about overconsumption. You're not improving your life and satisfaction with the money above that number. Now, you could be improving it in ways that you take that money and you apply it back to the community and you make a difference. You could be doing things with that. But all they're saying is, consuming more than a certain amount, your benefits and contentment go down. So therefore, how do you make sure that you improve your contentment and work on it? Um, suggestions for building contentment, um, meditation or prayer, 20 minutes a day, lowers your stress level. Your lower stress level, greater performance at work. Again, it's a very virtuous circle. It's not a vicious circle. You let stress get to you, you don't address it, you be frustrated, you go into work. Um, employers recognize there's frustration there, and it's hard for that person and employee to succeed. So I think that these things seem very simple, but look around. Look around in your lives and look around at the lives of your friends and family and say, are all of these people doing some of these basic things? I, I think you'd find the answer is no. So that's why we're here, and that's why we're trying to help you um, to make this plan early in your careers. Um, the things, the other things, cultivate social outlets and networks. I think that the joining a professional society, joining local trade groups, 
is a great way to network and it's also a great way to socialize and talk about what's happening in the industry and be aware of when things are changing. We talked about what do we need to do to change when the market's changing and FinTech and all of these things are going on. You gotta be talking to people. You gotta be talking to people outside your industry. You gotta be talking to people inside your industry. You gotta be aware and sharing what your ideas are and what your thoughts are with others and I think that cre creates a great deal of release and it allows you to succeed in terms of contentment. Um, manage risk is the last. And what's happened since we've implemented the chip card is that a lot more fraud has moved online. So because of that fraud moving online, if you look at the green bar, fraud cases processed are up 80%. Total damage in millions has gone from 125 million to almost 525. Um, people are finding it easier to defraud people online. And so they're, they're gearing up and they're doing it more. And then the median dollar loss um, has gone from 329 to 600. So when you look again at those people who have 400 or $500 less than that in terms of savings, they get hit with one online fraud, it's gone. Uh, or they're in debt. And now they're in debt and they need to figure out a way to get out of it. So this ties in with the emergency fund and uh, we think that online fraud is gonna continue to go up. So you just need to be incredibly careful in terms of sharing your information and protecting your computers and your web, you know, any access to public sh um, sharing. It's your information, keep it safe. Avoid anything that feels uncomfortable from someone who contacts you online or, or on the phone. Public networks and data sharing should be avoided. Keep your backups of all your credit card information, your cards, card numbers, your card phone numbers, because when you lose them and they're exposed and they're out in the public domain, um, you want to be able to cancel them quickly and have all that information on hand. Take pictures of your cards and store those pictures in the cloud or somewhere safe. Verify your transactions online and only work with vendors who you're sure of. There's also some great links in this presentation to different um, nonprofit sites where they can help you in terms of giving you ideas on how to improve your, uh, what you're doing. Uh, emergency fund, we think you need to set it up. We think it needs to be four to seven months. I think that uh, medical emergency, job loss, and home repair or car repair, they're gonna be the things that are gonna kill you when you don't have it something set aside for it. The biggest benefit of managing your FICO score, over the course of your career, you, if you have an above average score, you will uh, qualify for rates that will be lower and you will save about 110,000 over the course of your career. Managing your credit score is the same as managing your grade in Craig Ruff's class. You look at the different components, you say 30% is based on um, amount of debt, 30 payment history is 30%. You, you make sure you, you perform well in those things. The way do you perform well in those things is to uh, manage in terms of automate your payments. You shouldn't shouldn't be writing checks or doing things when you can automate. Automating establishes a better credit history. You should only use 30% of your credit card debt. So if you have a limit of 5,000, you should only be using 1,500 on that card. Establish those limits in your mind, your credit's gonna improve. Look at your credit history and try to eliminate different items that are on there incorrectly. Manage your credit the way you'd manage a class. Go about it. Look at the numbers and uh, we'll send you more details in the other slides in terms of the different categories and how you can improve your score. Your score is critical on jobs, on buying a home, buying a car, and also in terms of how you're gonna save on interest. Credit and debt, use your money wisely, shorten long-term goals. All aspects of this work together. There's not one part of this that you're going to be particularly great or particularly bad at. You work on all of them, you do the best you can, and ultimately your financial well-being will improve. Coping with Debt is a great site uh, in terms of how to manage the debt pay downs and some of the other strategies. Manage risk and fraud online. Credit and desk should be utilized carefully. Put yourself in a position to succeed by managing your FICO score 
and automate the payments below $150 to simplify your life and strengthen your scores. Whoops. All right. I'd like to thank our sponsors, ASFIP Society, who established us, the CFA Institute, who is promoting with some of our materials, and I'd like to thank ASIC for having us here today. Um, please follow us on ASFIP Foundation on LinkedIn, Twitter, and eventually when these guys finish with this video, we'll be on YouTube as well. So the idea is here, take the presentation, you're in a great position, 90%. If you think a 30% have a college degree and about 20 or 30% are business majors, that means that 92% of the population doesn't really have a familiarity with these concepts. That's why we have a financial literacy problem. And all of us in this room have those skills. And you could volunteer at a food bank, you could volunteer at delivering meals on wheels, or you can try to do something with a skill that you have right now. Take that skill, channel it in a good direction, help five people you know with this presentation or with links to these websites, and I think you'll find that the financial literacy and uh, your general well-being will uh, improve. Thanks.